onto the stage to give his inputs on the next topic which is crypto venture capital 101 so i would like to invite onto the stage onto the dais mr jose fernando pereira who's a who is an investment strategy and analysis specialist he is currently leading keras a web3 venture capital fund at near foundation focusing on culture and entertainment applications with his background at Swissborg Ventures, Jose has a deep understanding of market behavior and a passion for supporting startup successfully. So let's put our hands together for one very nicely dressed Mr. Jose Fernando Pereira. Welcome onto the stage. Thank you. Thank you so much. I am a little bit obsessed, and by little I mean to the point of unhealthiness about digital assets. Um, my journey began in the pandemic in 2020. It was purely driven by greed. I was trying to make a quick buck, and I was trading every single market narrative. Through this journey, I dove deeper and deeper into the technology, the use cases, and the potential for digital assets. And that's how I developed this passion for, uh, for research and analysis. Now, this journey was a roller coaster. It had very exciting highs, but very painful and expensive lows. Um, but it was through these learnings that I was able to crystallize those lessons into frameworks and processes that eventually opened my ways to enter a corporate venture arm and, and then to Kairos, which is a venture capital fund that's dedicated to crypto and culture. So today I'm going to be speaking about the investment process from start to finish. And this is going to be useful for you if you are a family office or an institution that's dipping your toes into crypto, or if you're an established fund and you want to refine your process of investing, then I'm going to be sharing the, the, our process at Kairos here. So first of all, what is venture capital? Just to get everyone on the same page, Venture capital is a type of financing that is provided to early stage companies for, that have long-term growth potential. Venture capitalists are the people that back entrepreneurs that are launching new businesses that are innovative, that are unique, and that sometimes have unproven business models. Um, so imagine, for instance, a brick and mortar, a fashion store in a main street it's going to have a very straightforward business model. So getting financing from a bank, it's not going to be difficult. However, if you are launching a technology platform, a crypto company, for example, then you're going to need a lot more luck. And, and that's when it gets complicated. And that's when venture capitalists come in because they have the expertise and the structure to be able to invest into these high risk, high reward companies. So this is the power law, statistic reality check. Um, what I meant with having the structure to support these businesses, 75% of venture-backed companies never return money to investors. That means that 75% of the companies they invest go to zero. And this is the reason why you shouldn't take money from your family and friends. Uh, and you have these specific type of investors that is designed to absorb the losses. Because you're going to have a portion of that, the remaining 25%, which are the good performers, you're going to have companies that do 2, 3, 5x, and you're going to have a handful of those that are going to have exceptional returns. And by exceptional returns, I mean beyond your dream successful. These are your Amazon, your Twitter, your Netflix, your Spotify, all of these technology companies that are now valued at the billions or even trillions. So the returns of these companies are what enable the fund to absorb the losses of the 75% that go to zero. But those companies represent 2.5% of a portfolio. So 2.5% of VC deals generate 100% of industry profits. Now, to spice things up a little bit more, make it a bit more difficult, you add crypto to the mix, and then you have a 42% greater risk of failure, meaning 90% of Web3 startups fail. 
compared to 63%, which is your, your rate for your traditional software as a service IT companies. Then the failure rate at first year is twice for Web3 companies. So 40% of Web3 companies fail in year one compared to 20% uh, for your technology startups. So if you like high risk, high reward, or you're a, a bit of a gambler like myself, then crypto venture capital might, might be the thing for you. Now, when we look at the investment strategy, it's broken down into three layers. You have the foundation, which is the investment thesis, and this is your fund's North Star. It is what are you going to be investing in? This is your high level view of the market. Then you have the portfolio model, which is how are you going to execute that thesis? Um, what is your capital deployment strategy? What is the size of your tickets? What's the duration of your investments? And then you have the investment analysis, which is the individual investments view on the risk reward. So that's how you analyze each individual deal. Now, now talking about the thesis, the first part, um, like I said, this is your North Star. This is what gives direction to the fund. Here you have an example of the market. That's a whole Web3 market. So it's very broad, even though if you have a fund that says that they focus on Web3, it is unlikely that they're gonna have the expertise to look at the same level to something that's tackling, let's say, interoperability, consensus mechanisms, bridges, versus if it's a music application or DeFi, which are very, very complex products. Um, so you select your focus market based on your team's ability. You look internally to find what's your team's ability to foresee success. So that means to identify whether this company is good or not. And then the second factor is your ability to help portfolio companies because venture capital is not only here, take the money, go and execute, but it is about the value that you can bring and that is your network, your expertise, your skills, and that should be factored into your investment thesis. A fine grained investment thesis is your edge as a fund. So I like this analogy when you enter a restaurant and then you see their menu and they have pizzas, they have tacos, they have Chinese food, and they have Indian food. And then you wonder, well, well, what's good in this restaurant, right, if they're doing all of these things? Whereas if you compare it with a master chef that specializes on one thing, on one type of ingredients, they know how to get the most out of it, then that's what you would want from a specialized fund. Uh, so one of the benefits is having that differentiated strategy that's going to result in better performance. Then you have deal sourcing. So imagine you do not have that and you're a general Web3 fund. All the deal flow that you get is going to be random. And your ability to go deep in analysis is going to be limited. Versus if you know exactly what you're looking for and you have this thesis fine-grained to the ultimate detail, you know exactly what you're looking for so you can go hunting for that deal flow. And the third point is the founder-investor fit. So founders, normally the most competitive deals, the, the best deals of all are difficult to get into, but founders will be able to identify which are the investors that they want based on their thesis, their expertise, and the value add in general that they bring to the table. So those are the benefits of having the thesis, which is the foundation of your strategy. Second, you have the portfolio model, and this is mostly number crunching. So, like I said before, 2.5% of deals are responsible for 100% of the profits. That means that you would need to have a portfolio size that's at least 50 investments so that you have the chance of landing one of those outliers. You might have 100 investments in your portfolio, and you're just unlucky, and you still don't get it, but remember, that it is these outliers, the ones that are responsible for the whole performance of the fund. So this is part of the modeling. The average VC has a 2% outlier to portfolio ratio. So you would need at least 50 investments. If you are a top quartile VC, then that ratio is 4.5. Um, the main takeaway is at least having 50 investments in your portfolio. Imagine that the chance of you landing one good company is 2% and you're only investing in 10 companies then it's a like, high chance that you're not going to land any and then your fund is just going to be a, a total loss. So uh, when I first got into venture capital, <laughs> there was a lot of discussion. Uh, I was just learning and they called venture capital is an art. So I asked uh, the other people in my team and it was how do you identify the good companies? 
and they said something around, you, you look at the founder in the eyes, and then you're going to know if they have what it takes. And although there's truth on that, you are going to have biases, be, depending on your background, depending on your ethnicity, your age, and then a founder that is a 35-year-old white male from Stanford is going to rank higher than another one, for example. Um, so that's why you need a data-driven approach so that you can separate these biases and have data that supports your decision so that you can have a clear picture of what are the value drivers and what are the risks. <clears throat> so companies look very similar in the early stages. How do you decide which ones to back? This is a graph that's very, very easy to understand. It is difficult to find predictors of success at such early stages. The only thing that you can see is what are the red flags, where are the risks? This is your investment analysis process and it is divided into four steps. The top part of the diagram is the deal funnel. So let's say you start with 100 deals, then you filter it down until you select one, which is the one you invest. If you're having a fund that is a 50 investment fund, then you're doing maybe 12 to 16 investments per year over a period of four years. It has four stages. Like I said, you have the first filter, which is you see the pitch deck, you meet the team, and then you decide if you discard it or not. Then you have the risk analysis. You have more pillars than these four, but you would see at these mainly. And then within these pillars, you have subsections where you're going to score each of them, add weight to each of these numbers, and then you're going to come up with a final score. Now, this is not a final decision. Let's say it's an investment that's a nine out of 10. It doesn't guarantee anything. But generally, if you have a, an investment opportunity with a high score, then you can overlook some of the things. If you have an investment that has low score, then you need to have very, very strong conviction in order to, to justify the capital deployment. And then lastly, you have due diligence, which is making sure that your numbers stack up. <clears throat> so your first filter, you need to have a compelling team. Um, and that's where I was saying, you know, there, good founders do stand out. Uh, then you have a large market opportunity. Like I said, we are in the business of finding companies that are going to reach these billion dollar valuations. So if the market that they're after is not big enough, then there's just no fit in a portfolio like a venture capital to, capitals. Lastly, you have the strategic fit. So there must be a investor founder fit. It has to fit your thesis. In our case, we have a strategic investor, which is near protocol. It's a blockchain infrastructure. So there has to be a fit with, the, with that as well. After you filter them, you're going to have a smaller group of companies. And then the companies that are doing things in a very unique way or have a, a, just a separate a, an advantage are going to stand out. You're going to see those patterns there. Second, we come to the risk analysis. And this is not binary. This is not zero one. You're going to have a spectrum where you have higher risk and lower risk. So I'll go into examples for each of these. Um, how do they manage their treasury? Do they have an active management strategy? There's nothing wrong. There's, it, it's actually recommended to have an active management strategy so you don't have cash just sitting there without doing anything. But how is that strategy being managed? Is it being pure crypto? Do they have it on an exchange? Because if you have it in an exchange, then you have a counterparty risk that is completely outside of your hands. <clears throat> There was this company um, that we were looking at last year. They were in the ticketing business. Uh, they were a ticketing platform. And they unfortunately, they had put, they raised a million, 1.6 million, and then they put 1 million of those funds into stablecoin yields. Then there was the liquidity crunch that happened in May of last year, and they were locked out of those funds. Then because they couldn't get access to these, these money, they were not able to pay salaries. People started jumping ship, and the, the company just ended up um, stopping. So that is a risk that you need to be aware of. Uh, ideally, you want them to have the ideal amount of cash. Uh, second, you have the use of funds. So lifeboat means, let's say we take the, the company from the first example. This company was going broke, right? Because they lost access to this money, so they needed to raise so that they can stay afloat for the next three months and then raise another round. This is not a pure indicator of failure because there's a chance that they raise this round and they get the money and they, they, they end up being successful, but the risk is just so much higher compared to one that has their green numbers that's already generating revenues and then the use of funds 
is to, let's say, acquire other, com other companies to take the revenue to that next level. And then you have the cap table. Being the first ticket, being the first investor is, of course, riskier than when you have a tier one or tier two VC that's already there, when you have financial alignment among investors. Again, it doesn't mean if you're under low risk that you have a tier one investor, so they took care of the due diligence and your risk is, is, is low. Um, but it's better than, than not having them. Last, you have projections, uh, top-down, wish-driven. Sometimes the market estimates are going to come from the CEO, the founder, and these people know their markets better than we do. They are experts in what they do, so they might be right. But anyways, we would prefer to see projections that are data-driven, that are backed by comparables um, for our analysis. These are more examples. Yeah, we agree with time. So... <clears throat> Founders is a good one. You're going to have founders that have unrelated experience. That's the first time that they're launching a business. Maybe they're very young and they don't have that entrepreneurial experience, but it still does not mean that they should be discarded. Just the risk, you need to understand, is higher compared to a founder that has a Web3 track record. Um, what else? Is it replicated? Pre-proof concept. So I think an, another good example is your technology team. So a higher risk one is, you're gonna see this very often, is companies that outsource their technology development to developer shops, and that's a good strategy for some. But then the risk is the developer shop not delivering the product on time, and that is outside of the hands of the company again. So what you would want to see ideally is they ha them having a CTO, an in-house team, full-time employees, and that are Web3 native. Because if you have a founder that has never touched smart contracts, for example, or Solidity before, your risk is going to be higher. Uh, then we come to the scoring model. Like I said, you have pillars, and then you have within markets, you're gonna have subcategories, and within them, you're gonna have a guideline for scoring. So within product, there is token. This is just to make it specific to crypto, but it's just one part of product. Product is way deeper. Um, you're gonna have the token utility, and you would analyze things like how likely are people to hold this token? What is the potential for retention? In tokenomics, how are, um, how's the allocation distributed among investors? Does the team have a fair allocation? Then you're gonna come to token fully diluted valuation. So you would like to see a good relative fully diluted valuation in comparison to the markets. So you can compare it with private deals. You can compare it with, with liquid tokens. You're gonna have lower score for reasonable, justifiable, higher relate, relative fully diluted valuation, and then you're gonna have an unjustifiable fully diluted valuation. So these numbers are going to be multiplied by the weight of each of these categories, and you're going to end up with a final score. Lastly, you're gonna have the due diligence, which is making sure that what they say is true. So in legal, you have looking at their incorporation documents, outstanding cases, licenses, terms, outstanding cases, for example, if you have a company that was started by three co-founders, let's say two of the co-founders jumped, they left the business, and they only left one, one founder. The founder goes and raises money, and then the co-founders come back because they thought that the company was worth nothing, so they just left it there, and they didn't take care of the legal side. And now, because the company's worth something, now they're coming back. So those are the things that you need to be aware of where their founders previously, when you're doing your due diligence. Then you have your technology, you look at your GitHubs, your source code, you look at security audits. In the finance side, you need to see their statements, their cash balances, their holdings. And in the commercial side, you see their contracts. Of course, the list is, is deeper, but if they say that they have all of these clients that are gonna come after the, the race, you need to make sure that they have legally uh, binding contracts that, that confirm that. So in summary, this is the, the takeaway. A fund's thesis is its North Star. No one can pick winners. You need a large portfolio that's in relation to the portfolio model and, and the recommended size. Um, third, analysis does not provide the answer for investments, but it clarifies the risk and value drivers for informed decisions. 
Fourth, a systematic approach prevents an emotional confirmation bias towards potential investments. Example, falling in love. So this is very, something very common, right? This deal came from your friend or from this person recommended. So you immediately have a positive bias and you overlook all of those things. So that's when the analysis comes very handy. Um, lastly, you have diverse teams also serve as a robust mechanism against bias. So imagine that you have a team where everyone is finance. <clears throat> this has happened to us. You're looking at everything purely numerical. You might be missing things on the product side. You might be missing things on the team side. If you have someone that has, let's say, a psychology background and they can see flaws on the team culture, how's the leadership, then all of these differences in background are, are good in terms of when it comes to making these decisions. So you would want to have people from different ages, from different backgrounds, like we said, technology, finance, culture, and um, that's just going to help you with your investment decisions. So that's all. I covered it a little quickly. Hope it was clear. Uh, thank you so much for having me. And um, let me know if you have any questions. We'll be more than happy to, to answer anything. <laughs> yeah, let me know if you have any questions. Does anyone have any questions? No? Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah, I don't know if you want to pass another mic to them. Jose, you know me, I know you. I'm running this seed round from the last three, four, six months, right? Why a VC would be interested into a Web3 project when there is no cash flow, balance sheet, no books to show off, just pure on founders and the tokenomic strategy or what it is? Right, so, so the way that venture capital funds are structured, you're gonna have seed funds and you're gonna have series A funds. So series A comes after seed and venture capital funds at seed level, they specialize in these type of companies that are pre-revenue, pre-approval concept and the way that they look at companies is different than series A. Because when you're at series A, you want to look at revenues, right? You want to have a proven product market fit and that's why the valuations are higher and the raises are higher. So you would need to have a fund that sees that difference first so that they can look at your project from a different perspective. Because when you're looking at a company that's so early, a lot of times you're gonna have three founders and a pitch deck. So you have to, the weight that you assign to each of these factors is gonna be very, very different at that stage than at Series A, which is gonna be a lot more financial. All right, so now as we are seeing the tokenization in the Web3, right? And yeah. Tokenization comes with a lot of curves, which is real estate, where there is a traditional asset. Now, there is also tangible and intangible assets as well, right? So when it comes to a project on Web3 with the tokenization strategy, what does VCs look for, like in terms of valuation of the asset or valuation of the strategy? No, it's not valuation of the asset, because as a tokenization platform, you're an intermediary. Imagine that you are an Airbnb connecting the property owners with the people that want to invest in the tokenized real estate, for example. So you would look at the economies of scale in terms of the platform and when does it reach that mass consumer level? Because the way that these platforms will make money would be out of that commission. So this is not our area of focus, our area of focus is culture, but from my understanding is that tokenization platforms are making a commission that's somewhere between one and 2.5%. Um, so the valuation would be on that potential rather than the amount of assets on the, on the platform, let's say. Thank you, Jose. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so firstly, thank you for the great explanation. So I have actually uh, two questions. So when you were explaining the four-step uh, investment analysis process, I just wanted to know um, in which step do you think venture capitalists go wrong uh, commonly and are there any ways to avoid it? Secondly, my uh, question would be, uh, are there any AI tools that you use in your daily uh, work practices? And if so, um, what and how does it help? Okay, so your first question is, where do we go wrong in this four-step process? Um, so the first filter is something that we see very quickly because if you're getting, let's say, 2,000 deals per year and you're looking at I don't know, five to 10 per day, then you have to be efficient in looking at them, even if you have that proactive strategy. Uh, so there's a chance that those, you miss some there. Then when it comes to the model, this is something proprietary, right? So there's no standard, this is the correct way, this is built internally. 
so this is something that we continue improving as we go. But I think that as long as the model is consistent and you're analyzing this, the companies the same way, then your score should be relatively consistent. And then your second question was about the AI tools that we use. Uh, right now, a, a little bit of finance GPT for getting, like, it's, it's a very basic fundamental layer of the, of the financial analysis. But I think just that one, yeah. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, my question is very basic one, but it's really a yeah. good one, I guess, from the failure rate perspective, you know, so you said like 98% deals go bust for the VCs. I, I really don't understand actually with all this like wonderful analysis by the VCs for like for, you know, picking the right startups and right founders and still 98% goes fail. So it's not 98% that fail, 75% fail, that, which is still very high. 2.5% uh, are the companies that deliver outsized returns. So, so 2.5% are the outliers. These are the companies that give you outsized returns and then let's say you enter a valuation of, for example, LinkedIn. LinkedIn, they raised around in 2004. They were valued at 20 million, if I'm not mistaken. I think I checked like a month ago and they were valued 38 billion. <laughs> so that kind of companies falls into the outliers. So it's very, very difficult. Again, like you said, 75% go to zero. And how, why is that so high? It's because even if you do all of these analyses, there are things that you just can't predict. If the founders have a fight internally and one decides to jump, you know, th those things, even if everything stacks up, if you have one of those things, that fails, the company, the, the chances of success, of that level of success, go lower. So what you want to have is a good score on each of these, on all of these, to have a higher probability. But if you have a big market and a good product, but then your star CTO goes out, then your product also goes down. Then your finance might be affected as well. So it's a combination of all of these factors that's going to make the company successful. And, and there are things that we can analyze, and there's some things that you know, we, we have to place better on as well. Based on your experience, uh, what are the major, maybe two, three reasons out of these 75% who are like uh, uh, these companies that fail? So what are the top two or three reasons uh, based on the empirical studies, you know, historical data basis. So, so if we go Web3 specific, crypto specific, I think it's of course product market fit. Also, if you look at the industry as a whole, we have not achieved product market fit as, a, as blockchain itself. Um, but I think that you have a big barrier when it comes to having a few users, right? You're gonna have the people that are, you know, advanced users of this technology and they use it for novelty. But there's a big difference between that and onboarding a billion users when you get your mom and your grandma to use it. So making that leap, I think, is a big barrier for all of these applications. Um, what else? I think, so that in terms of product and market. Finance, I think that just planning your runway and planning ahead is something that I haven't seen very often. So you need to have a long-term plan because if you raise funds, you have a runway let's say of one year, you need to start racing way ahead and you cannot predict the market because we can be in a market conditions like we are right now and then racing funds is not gonna take you one month. Racing, let's say it's three million, it's gonna take you six months, maybe. So if you don't plan that properly, you run out of cash in the middle of your second round and then the company cannot continue operating. So I think those are the two, two main uh, things. If you allow me, can I ask another question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Valuation, so yeah. now I think the VCs have changed their thinking process uh, in terms of the valuation. It used to be like a few months back or maybe a year ago. And now uh, I guess uh, it, it's totally changed in the, uh, when it comes to the valuation of the startups, you know, so the, those are corrected, I guess, prior to like maybe six months or maybe a year ago. What's, what's your uh, feedback on that? What's your view on that? Is it still like, the same model that grow at every cost or people are thinking of bottom line success now from the VC mindset perspective? No, of course, there's so many companies that just, just are disappearing and are shutting down every day. So people, uh, we're a lot more sensitive in terms of valuations. Uh, when you look at the numbers specifically, 
You're going to have the public valuations that are, the liquid tokens are, were down 90% from a year ago. So those adjusted immediately. But venture valuations took a longer time to catch up to those valuations. So right now, I think good teams raising seed rounds are raising at around 10 million, between 8 and 12. Some exceptional teams are raising seed rounds around 20, 25. Um, but at least those are the numbers that I'm seeing now. And uh, yeah, to your point, there was a period of irrationality when it came in 2021, early 2022, because I think that it took a lot of funds some time to adjust their perceptions to where we were in the market. So of course, it's easy to say right now, looking back, if when we went quantitative tightening, that everything was downwards from there. But I think lots of funds, ourselves included before, it took around six months to really adjust to the expectations saying this is a long-term bear market versus this is just a short correction and then we're going to get back up. So I think that influenced evaluations. So you saw teams that were raising at 40 million and then they couldn't reach those targets. So they raised at a lower round and then at a lower round and then all the evaluations just adjusted to this new baseline. Right, just the final question. So any, any regrets that you missed the deals that they were good to you know, get uh, from an investment perspective that you, you wish you could not miss them, uh, you know, in terms of investment. Yeah, there's always going to be those, the, the, the one that got away and then you didn't see it and then they go and raise. There's always going to be that. Um, but I think, f fortunately, <laughs> because it's been on a downtrend since then, all the valuations are lower. So there are more deals that I'm grateful that we didn't get in because they were racing at these higher rounds and now they're racing at way lower rounds. So I, I would say that there's way more opportunistic valuations right now than there, there were one year ago. Thanks. Thanks yeah. for your answers. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Good. Well, thank you very much. Thank you all. Yeah.